This podcast is supported by anonymous friends of George Washington's Mount Vernon. Hello and welcome to Intertwined Stories. I'm your host, Jeanette Patrick. In this miniseries, we're taking a deeper dive into the history behind the podcast, Intertwined, the enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. To create that show, we interviewed over 20 scholars, some of whom are descendants of Mount Vernon's enslaved community, for over an hour each. We couldn't fit everything into the main series, so we're happy to bring you extended versions of some of those conversations now. As a child, Ann Chen didn't understand her family's connection to Mount Vernon, the Washingtons, or the Custis family. But later in life, she came to learn that she was a descendant of Sal Twine. Twine was a woman assigned to work as a field laborer on Doe Run Farm. She was owned by the estate of Martha Washington's first husband. Twine's husband was named George. He was owned by Mary Ball Washington, George Washington's mother. Together, the couple had seven children. And after the Washingtons died, Twine was inherited by one of Martha's grandchildren. We spent a delightful afternoon talking to Chen about her family's history and her journey to find out more about her family's relationship to Mount Vernon. You'll first hear a little bit about Chen herself before we travel back to the 18th century to learn about her ancestor, Sal Twine, and her life as a woman enslaved in Virginia. Could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. I'm Ann Chin. I was born in Washington, D.C. I now live in Jacksonville, Florida. I guess I can say that for probably a good portion of my life, history has been a real interest. And the more I've learned about my family, I've become more and more focused on that. I spent a good portion of my life in government service and focused again on family and child services and would do anything not to end up in a classroom, uh, which my father and my mother both said, you know, there are alternative routes. But it's strange that I would say that in the last five years, I have found myself doing more education than anything else in in terms of uh, what takes up my time. I have uh, three children, five grandchildren. They're all over the country. I miss Washington, D.C. terribly. But COVID has at least encouraged the Zoom calls, the visits, which are probably more frequent than actual the physical ones. So I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm married to Charlie Cobb, who is an author, journalist, He was active in the civil rights movement of the 60s and uh, then was a journalist in foreign affairs, worked for National Geographic, so that I've had the ability or the privilege to travel a lot in this world because of geographic policy of trying to keep marriages together. Uh, At least for us, they were successful. I don't know much what else I can say about myself. I now I'm working with the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project, which has identified 55 arrival locations in the continental U.S. related to the arrival of Africans into this country. I'm very interested in promoting and informing people of the presence and contributions of those citizens who are African descended. There is, I think for many families, a lack of information or even the ability to ferret out the information that does exist. There also is a need to expand this narrative as I think this interview is doing to include African Americans in what are parts of of American history that have excluded them for the most part over centuries. I'm descended from the Twine family, and I basically would say that that family, according to documents, was enslaved for 193 years. Uh, The first member being emancipated in 1850. And there are connections uh, to that person, to Mount Vernon. 
Yeah, so if we could just go maybe a little deeper, if you could tell us about your connection to Mount Vernon and the Twine family. You know, I've tried to sort of conform to the Mount Vernon documents because that was the first first place I learned about Sal. I did not know anything about her. I would say for the first almost half of my life. I knew something was going on between my family and Mount Vernon, but what it was was a total mystery. As a child, we did at least two trips a year from Washington, D.C. to Mount Vernon. The adults in the front seat, the kids in the back, We had no idea why we were going out to this place and were frequently, if not continuously, thrown out of any of the in-house tours. So we had no sense of of a connection. We, We just thought maybe my mother, my aunt, and my grandfather just wanted to see the place so that we romped on the grass while the adults took the tour. We also did the same at Arlington House, again, without any context, until we were old enough to choose not to go any longer. But the only highlight for us as children was the cherry vanilla ice cream. That was pretty much all that attracted us for years. And I remember that when people would come to Washington, D.C. to visit, Uh, my father, and this is after my mother had died, would say, oh, Ann, take him to Mount Vernon. I was like, why? But, you know, being a dutiful daughter, I would do that, and, and people would walk through the house. But again, I had no sense of connection. I can't exactly remember when, but I think it was probably in relation to Tudor Place that I learned of our connection our family's connection to Mount Vernon. And I called Mary Thompson and found out that she was the historian who pretty much centered the history of the African descendant at Mount Vernon. So I asked her, I could not say, and I will, I will, I have said this repeatedly, I could not describe my family as slaves when I talked to Mary Thompson. In fact, I broke down and started crying. I did not want to use that word. And finally she said, well, if it's Tudor Place, uh, you're talking about Sal Twine and her children. And I said, yes. And I said, I'm descended from Barbary, according to the Tudor Place people. And she said, that's Sal Twine. And uh, she made the connection graciously for me and I think understanding my discomfort and she said we have a lot of information on Sal and I will be more than willing to share and that began a relationship that actually continues to this day. I found out then that Sal was Custis property which is why she ended up at Tudor Place or at Barbary ends up at Tudor Place. Uh, Sal and her children, I think, were assigned probably to Oakland Farm or in Seneca, Maryland, at one of the Peter properties. That's the best that I can tell, only because uh, the records, I don't know where they are in terms of the farm. But I also then learned that Sal's husband, George, was assigned to the mansion farm and that he in fact was originally the property of Mary Ball Washington and so that he was a quote Washington property and that initially George Washington leased him from his mother when he inherited Mount Vernon from uh, his brother and so George came to Mount Vernon, and eventually uh, he becomes a gardener and is assigned there. According to the information that Mary Thompson gave me, Sal was at Dog Run, which is where the mill and the distillery were. But in a later conversation with Mary, she said that the family also was at Muddy Hole, 
that would have actually put Sal and the kids closer to George at the mansion farm. But uh, most of the records uh, reflect that she is at Dog Run. On one of my visits uh, with the family, I did go out to Dog Run. And of course, the only thing there is the structure, the mill, and I guess maybe it was also a distillery. And I walked around uh, as much of the property as I could, imagining life there. The notes of this Polish visitor to Mount Vernon describes it, and I couldn't imagine where their cabins were. But again, thinking about winter, thinking about summer, it looked desolate to me. And when I learned that the prototype that actually Mount Vernon has used for the uh, cabin of the enslaved came off of Dog Run, when I went to see that, and I know that there was some resistance even initially to installing that structure and including that on the mansion plantation property. And I looked at it and you know, I I understand that it's a new structure that it was built using the outline of what they had found, but I think it's so much better than what the reality was, especially based on the description of someone who had actually been there. So I would hope at some point that what this Polish visitor wrote would be included so that people are not looking at a two-story building as opposed to a cabin of enslaved people who were basically maintained almost at a minimum, you know, whatever they could supplement their lives with. Then realizing that George is at the mansion farm the family is at another location they were only allowed weekend visits or holiday visits you know you begin to have a sense of what that life really was I work with teaching for change and I always want to hear the reaction of students who visit Mount Vernon that cabin for the enslaved that's next to the property, uh, to the mansion, or the big house. I have heard kids say, oh, it looks like uh, a camping bunker, someplace where you go for summer camp. So once again, if you put this up, if you save it as a place of history, I think that you need to be more accurate in describing the real living conditions that people experienced and not this almost pristine presentation. I think the integration of the reality or the first-hand descriptions would be important. I am also frustrated because I don't know where Sal was before she came to Mount Vernon. I would love to know at which property of the Custis where she came from and I and she may have had children before she came to Mount Vernon or with George I don't know I mean things are sketchy and I understand you know there wasn't a commitment to satisfying my need for information but I've also been contacted by people at Williamsburg who are tracing the twines and I do find it interesting that that family has carried a last name through at least the mid-17th century, actually from 1712, with the uh, parceling of property between Byrd and John Custis IV. And that's how, and I say we, my family, Twine family, ended up as Custis property. What makes them unique in that sense they always have this last name through the records I mean because most of the enslaved people only have a first name I don't know 
when Thal came to Mount Vernon. I just don't know. I would love to find out, and I don't know whether there are records that reflect that. It would be really helpful if someone would do a deep dive into the Custis estate and to really understand who is not just part of the group of people Martha controls during her lifetime, but what the entire estate actually looks like, because we just, we don't know. And we know that sometimes people come up from different Custis lands to Mount Vernon, and sometimes we have names, but other times we don't. And that's an area that really needs a lot of study done, because there are so many people who, since they're not physically here, we've not done a good job of studying. If you go back in those records, the Custis records, there are twine people. There are the twines that eventually uh, get transferred when Martha Peter marries Thomas Peter. There's that family of twines that gets transferred immediately at the marriage and then sold by Thomas Peter. It's a huge family and Tudor Place makes reference to some twines that are over in Arlington. You know, in terms of Tudor Place, you know, Sal and the three children basically disappear but George her son is still there and I'm, I'm trying to even find out after George the gardener the, the names are so confusing because my family is so unimaginative <laughs> in terms of naming people George Sal's husband when he is freed I still don't know where he goes you know whether he ends up in Gum Springs or whether he knows where his family is in Frederick, Maryland. If he just give me a last name, you know, I could start going through census records because now he's a free man. If you're not going to stay at Gum Springs, I mean, to me, the most practical thing would be to move to Maryland where there's at least a significant group of free African descended people. So you might be safer there and then you can, you know, sneak off or or connect with your wife and your children. I mean, it is, I think that when people look at this history, they seldom look at it as if they're dealing with human beings. You know, I mean, what would you do is a good question. Intertwined Stories is a production of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and CD Squared. I'm Jeanette Patrick, your host for this episode, which was produced by Jim Ambusky. Jim Ambusky and I co-created and co-wrote the main series, Intertwined, The Enslaved Community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Brenda Parker brought it to life as our wonderful narrator. Kurt Dahl of CD Square was our lead producer and audio engineer. Thank you to the anonymous friends of George Washington's Mount Vernon, whose generous financial support made this show possible. Please rate and review Intertwined on your favorite podcast app. We'd love to hear what you think, and it'll help more people find the series. And remember to check out our website for full transcripts, teacher resources, and suggested readings. You'll find us at www.georgewashingtonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening.